All right. So, um, is it, uh, does it, does the size matter? I don't know. It's, it's supposed to be a, a mirror, right? You know? Well, just a mirror, yeah. But, I mean, does it matter whether it's, a, like, a, a, a bathroom mirror or, a, you know, a, a private mirror? Does it, uh, does that really matter? All I ever heard you say was it had to be a mirror. It has to be a mirror. Okay, of some kind. Of some kind. Okay, well, I, we, well, I have this one. You have that one? Okay, well, we got a mirror. I have, uh, it's a compact mirror. Does that count? It's, I, I don't. They're always bigger. I don't think it makes a difference. Okay. Okay, okay so let's, so we, should we try it? I guess so, yeah. You, if you want to try, if you, look, if you're scared to try it, I'm. Why are we trying? Well, you know okay, what? Look, we've, all this time we've been married, we've never done this. So all let's, right, let's, so let's, yeah. let's, let's see what happens. Okay. Okay. okay so, so all right. Up. Okay, hold it up. Okay. Okay, how many times is it? Uh, it's five times. That's a lot. Well, I don't know, but I think, I think okay. we can, okay, so let's right. try this. Okay, right, 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 right. Okay. Candy, Candy man. man. Candy man. man. Candy man. How many is that? That's um, three. three. Candy man. Candy man. Right. Wait, 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 wait. Are you sure? Do we want to say it? Do we sure we want to say it? Uh, uh, I maybe don't maybe know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe maybe not. I tell you, well, we'll, we'll do it later. Oh, it's, it's time for the time. show. That's oh, right. Hey, it's time for the show. Everybody. Hi there. Hi. We were uh, we were busy. With, we were trying. No, no. We weren't doing anything. Okay. No. So we chickened out. Anyway, I'm Tanana Reevedu. <laughs> and I'm Stephen Barnes. And welcome to Facebook Live as we talk about Candyman, Sweet Candyman. Candyman, Victim Sweet Candyman. Vic- as Monster. Victim as Monster. So uh, we do these every weekend. And yes. we're tr- trying to settle down to have you know one time, so you know that every Saturday, every Sunday, we'll be right here for you, and then you'll be here with us. Up until recently, we were doing Afrofuturism broadcasts, but we've shifted to horror. I just wrapped up my Sunken Place Black Horror class yes. at UCLA. The saddest thing happened Ooh. because of the fires. They canceled the last day of class. That's, so that I, really is sad. You were actually very upset I about that. I was very upset. You should have seen me just staring. I'm trying to create a Facebook page for them. I was just staring at all their faces because it oh. was such a special class. And we had a couple of student films that I thought were so good that I was going to screen on the big you know, screen for them. And it would have been so nice. And, it really would have. But, was, but they, they got a lot out of that class. Well, they I really got did. a lot out of that class. Yes. It was a pretty amazing experience. And as a matter of fact, um, just this past week, I did a television interview uh, where I was interviewed about black horror. So this is becoming a thing, people. And I found, guess what I found out? What did you find out? I had just missed a celebrity that they interviewed. A certain celebrity. By two hours. Two, like, just, just ships passing in the night. And guess who it was? Well, who was it? Tony Todd, It man. was, to- it was Tony Candy Todd. Man. Oh, I said it the fifth time. But does it have to be like the, in, in a row? I don't know. Are we, are we okay? okay. We'll we anyway, didn't do that, that. that never happened. But anyway, yeah, so I, had, I came this close to like the epic selfie I would have taken <laughs> with Tony Todd. And plus, I'm a longtime fan, not just from Candyman, but many years ago uh, when Steve and I were in Seattle, he starred in King Hedley II, uh, the August Wilson play. So we got to, uh, to see him on stage, which, you know, he's very proud of that work. So... So, yes, uh, I'm so disappointed that I didn't get a chance to talk to him. But I'm very excited that he was also being interviewed for the show, which I'm not allowed to talk about. In fact, pretend I didn't say anything. That's right. I, I but this is just family, right? We can trust all of you. Anything, anything that's said here doesn't go any further, right? Right. Okay. So, so okay. yeah, but that was very exciting to be able to uh, run into to Tony Todd and uh, such a iconic role, right, people? If you've seen Candyman... And if Candyman scared the pants off of you, let me see your likes and your hearts and your loves, because you know you have, and you know you know most of you wouldn't do that mirror test. Yeah, either. and how how many of how many you have ever tried, tried it? that? I mean, just to see whether or not it was going to work. Yeah, you know, because so. you know, I can think of the scariest stories that I've ever read, movies that I've seen. They actually got me to react as if something might right. happen to me in the real world. You know, when you're not sure, why well, mess with it is is the question. Yes, <laughs> that's the it's, question. It, it, well, it's like it. There's a chance there might be a goblin yeah. behind that door. Yeah, <laughs> yes, so, so. we're getting like that's the stereotype. You know, they have about black folks in horror movies. You know, you really have to work hard to get around that. Why would I do this? Why would I do that? <laughs> why would I go there? Absolutely. <laughs> if you heard a noise, I'm going that way. The noise is this way. 
I'm going that way. That would make sense. I don't know what what holds me here. <laughs> why why would I stay when there's something that might eat me? Right. You know? exactly. It's like you know bite marks and you know like this. I ain't that pretty, but I don't want to be that ugly. No, you know what I'm exactly. So that's the challenge when you're doing a black horror or a horror for black folks. But but Candyman is that enduring uh, film. It was released in 1992. People are still scared of it. Uh, it. It spawned, I think, two sequels. Yes, it did. Farewell to the Flesh and Day of the Dead. And of course, you know that he, he just knows all this. <laughs> just like, yeah, of course. Um, and uh, which is a good thing. That's a good thing. Is, is that a good, it's thing? A good thing? You tolerate? You tolerate that? You do thing. not. You do not hate me. So, so uh, yeah, we were very excited to see Tony Todd on stage in Seattle. That was a really special evening. We also got to meet August Wilson. Yeah, we had. Uh, yeah. So Charles Johnson, August Wilson. And, and, and us, <laughs> is that correct we, grammatically? We and we, and we, we were no, no, with. we were with. What's yes, it say? We were with Charles <laughs> Johnson and August Wilson at a cafe in Seattle after watching King Headley. Yeah. And, uh, Tony Todd and King Headley. And we were there until like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Were. And that was during that time, you know, some of you who know August Wilson's process, he, when he stages a play, he's revising. So this was, I think, the first show. I think it was the first show that we saw. Where oh. It was like fresh out of the pan. Well, I, I love the play, but more than that, I love the conversation. Yeah, Just being able to talk about literature and life and, you know, America and hopes and dreams and race and history and, you know, in, in the place of the artist. You know, why is, why, why does his work stir people the way it does? Right. Because what I'm, I'm, I'm like hanging on every word because this is my opportunity. You know, how does someone create this kind of impact? That's certainly what I want for my work. Absolutely. And uh, actually, we're here to talk about the impact of that work on all of us as we talk about black horror and that iconic role Tony Todd played in Candyman, which is where a lot of us saw him for the very first time um, and were scared to death of him. So there's Tony Todd as Candyman. You know, um, I have a little story, I mean, in terms of Candyman, something I just realized as we were talking about the film, you know, because I've always wanted to be uh, a writer. And ever since I was four, some of you have heard me talk about that and started writing little picture books and that kind of thing. And I always loved horror. Um, and, and I wanted to, to see more black horror, even though, even before I realized I wanted to see more black horror. It mm -hmm. was like, I, we would, you know how it is. You watch what you can watch. Right. So you identify with, with whichever characters you, you have to identify with. So for a long time, I was in that space. But... But yeah, it was it was a bit of a, a challenge because I didn't know any any black people who were writing horror. I never read anybody writing horror, right. uh, and and so then in 1992, this movie based on a Clive Barker short story, The Forbidden, right, which introduced a character, Candyman, came out called Candyman, and I was living in Miami, and my mother, uh, by the way, I. I've also mentioned this several times. Patricia Stevens, do my late mother. It's her birthday today. She it would have been her birthday today. Happy birthday, happy mom. birthday, mom. And she loved horror, so I I can't even imagine that we didn't go see Candyman together. So so of course that's that was like a mother daughter experience for for us to to see that. Here's this highly. I mean, let me just break it down for a moment, and y'all know what I'm talking about. Here's this highly charismatic black character, um, a monster, yes, but also a character, um, brought to life by Tony Todd and given a uh, humanity through his, his backstory, which basically was that he was the son of a, a former slave. And, um, it was about what, 1890, I think it was. He, yes. he had a, a white woman he was in love with and the father hired some goons to, to chop off his hand cause he was an artist. So chop off his hand, and um, let me go to this slide because this shows his uh, the art angle from the film. Um, so chopped off his hand, covered him in honey. All the bees were biting him. So you have that terrible moment where he has all these bees coming out of his mouth, um, and burned him up. I believe even after that. So he was mutilated. He was burned. He was yeah. speed. I mean everything is bead or word anyway. He was bead. <laughs> Uh, Tony Todd, the actor, was bead, as a matter of fact, even though they were supposed to be very young bees so that they would not have as much of a propensity to sting, 
I understand he got stung many times. And what's that story you were telling me? Oh, well, it was that he got, apparently he got a paid a hundred dollars. I think it was for every bee sting. So he, you know, he cleaned up. Not enough. Because <laughs> he for definitely me, got stung. Not enough for me. But anyway, I mean, so here's this fascinating, of course, watching it the first time, I'm just fascinated, of course, by this backstory. I'm a child of history. My parents were civil rights activists. Uh, I'm no stranger to the violence of uh, racial violence in American history. So the, it, this plot line was echoing uh, those stories. And when you raise it up, it, it, it validates that at one level this happened, you know, which is not something that you, you see very often. So, yeah, there it was. And even though I, I, I more consciously remember an interview with Anne Rice and reading Mama Day that convinced me to start writing my first novel, I find it very interesting that I started writing my first black horror novel literally almost within 30 days of seeing Candyman. So, coincidence? No, I don't, I, think, I don't so. think it's a coincidence. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's a direct line either. I think it's a matter of critical mass. Right. You know, that um, one of the one of the things, one of the secrets, the things we want to talk about today is that if you don't control the images of your history, other people will control it and not to your benefit. Right. Um, that, that I think that for both of us... Uh, Getting into black horror, black science fiction, black fantasy is about wanting to control those images. It's about feeling that when we appeared in these movies, these um, uh, plays, these books, these television shows, it was not to our advantage. That it was, you know, it was often we we were often dehumanized. I'll talk more about that later because this is this is your story. I'm going to just guess at the little girl that you were. Much like Octavia Butler looked out at the world, said, "Where am I?" Yes. You know, you saw these images, and Candyman may have been. I mean, Night of the Living Dead came out first, almost ten years earlier. But if I maybe it was it ten years old? I, I forget. But 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 Candyman. Oh was, wait, no, no, no! It was more than ten years. Was it, Night was of the Living Dead was sixty-eight. Sixty-eight. And what yeah. year was Candyman? It's Ninety-two. Ninety-two. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. So it was more than ten years earlier. Candyman may have been the first. The major theatrical release with a with blackness at the core of it in a way that actually did touch on on being human. Right now, I I think that part of that was because the original story was the name of that story again. The Clyde Barker's original story, the un the forbidden the forbidden was not about a black character. No, so when they when they remade it, or rather when they adapted it for film and decided to set it in the United States. Yeah, it was it was originally set in England. Set he in was England. Blonde. He's a blonde haired white guy and in England of course there are at least more conscious preoccupation is caste and class and that sort of thing. And I'm sure that played into the storyline. But when you bring that state side, that of course turns into racialized history and um I would say lots of images of urban decay and that sort of thing, but also tied to this history of a man who was uh, basically uh, symbolically castrated and symbolically lynched by a white mob, you know, something so real out of our American history and that's what they did and they were a little nervous about doing it they went to the NAACP yes they did and they and actually went to the NAACP and asked and here is what my thought is for the allies who are watching this wondering how can you present these images with respect ask because just the act of asking suggests that you are aware that there can be problems as soon as you admit that you don't know as soon as you say my cup is empty fill it will you please tell me what I can do to make this good automatically I'm going to relax. I'm dealing with someone who is aware that they do not know. A person who knows that they do not know can be taught. Right. They can be shared with. So, you know, men writing stories about women, if you don't know any women, ask, you know, go out and meet some women. You know, white people, if you don't know any black people, black people, if you don't know white people, gay people, if you, you know, straight people, if you don't know gay people, ask members of that group and automatically you start becoming an ally just because you've acknowledged their humanity. So this story, Candyman, of course, is beloved by horror audiences uh, all over and of all types, white horror lovers, black horror lovers, and we all have different reasons uh, for appreciating it. But, you know, even so, it's not a story that was designed uh, to be black horror from its inception, you know, the short story, obviously. Yes. It was not written from the perspective, I would say, of a black artist. No, but it started... With the idea of humanity. Right. I think that because Clive Barker wrote it about another white person, just perhaps of a different class, perhaps of his own class, 
there was humanity built in the story. You translate that to a black person, and the, the automatic assumption is one of humanity rather than inhumanity. I think that when he went to the NAACP and asked the question, their reaction was apparently, hey, why can't we be monsters? Why can't we be ghosts? Right, but at the same time, I, I would have to think that when, well, at least unconsciously, when I set out to write my own first novel, The Between, actually, we can go back to the uh, our faces. Okay, like hold on. Show out my little book here. But when I, I decided to write my first novel, The Between, I took the approach. This is actually the first copy of, of my book I ever received. So it has the plastic casing on it. But uh, yeah, this is my first and, novel, which I wrote. And that's her there. Yeah, uh, in 19, See that? Isn't that a cute picture? In 1992. Let me tell you. Isn't she normal? <laughs> but so, so <laughs> in 1992. I decided to take on my own take of that relationship to white supremacy and white supremacist violence, which was to contemporize it and create uh, an antagonist who was literally uh, a, t a white supremacist, right. you know, and and that was my own my own take on uh, racial terror, you know, and uh, now at the time, of course, uh, especially in film, you were more likely to see black people um, as the monsters, not the heroes. Well, even right? monsters or just, you know, victims, long suffering, right. you know, you know, woe is me, milk and honey on the other side. Help. You know, yeah. you know, please white Jesus, come save me. You <laughs> yes, know? thank you. <laughs> I have seen all those movies. <laughs> Every single one of those movies, but it's so in any case, and I like some of them. I mean, it's like when well, you don't have a lot. Had, that's mean, all we that's had. That's all we had. All we had. So in any case, um, yes, definitely uh, wanted to write a story that would embrace it even more closely to um, the way I saw some of that history playing out in a contemporary way. Right. Candyman is sort of a, a fever dream version of how that white supremacist violence plays out. You know, yes. And even though it is victim, he's victimized, turned into monster, that movie is a fine film. And it is elevated by a, a wonderful performance by a tremendous actor, Tony Todd, who brought oh. serious gravitas and by to the that way, role. I just realized, some people haven't seen it, so could you go back to the Candyman, Candyman? Okay. But we don't have a mirror. So some people <laughs> haven't seen it. So this woman on the left, uh, and I forget her character's okay, name. Okay, hold on. Let me, let me, let me, let me switch. Me here. I forget the character's name, but she, uh, the woman who's about to appear on the left, is basically an anthropologist who is studying what some believe to be an urban legend she believes may be rooted in truth about a figure named Candyman, who has been basically terrorizing uh, the inner city community of Cabrini Green. And Cabrini Green, which has now been torn down, uh, the people scattered and all sorts of things, um... Cabrini Green was a very dangerous place to live, uh, the stuff of legend. I know, Steve, you uh, said something at Cabrini Green. At yeah, I actually, well. went, I actually visited Cabrini Green to do research. Right. And they had, you know, and the people were very aware of their, of their image. They had, you know, metal detectors at the door, and anybody going in and out of there had to pass, you know, res uh, sort of a, a, a citizen's watch. You know, mm. by the residents. They were, they were trying, they were policing their own. They were, right. they were trying to deal with, with the problems of poverty. And, and living in this situation. So, so basically, in, in researching this, and this is her friend played by a uh, delightfully adorable Cassie Lemons there, who went, went on to later direct one of my favorite movies, Eve's Bayou. Um, or did Eve's Bayou come first? But anyway, they were both in the No, 90s. I'm pretty sure no, this came this first. this came first. So in any case, uh, the two of them are investigating this. At one point, they make a visit to Gabrini Green. Uh, Cassie Lemons' character is like, I'm not going out of the car. <laughs> you know, again, that problem with the black character in the horror movie. Yes. Well, I, you can go in there if you want to. I'm not. I'm leaving right now. So, okay. No, you know, and, and she, that... <laughs> well, we can touch on, on, on my gripe there later, but, but go anyway, ahead. But anyway, it was sort of... So, but they're sort of exploring this kind of urban jungle imagery. There is definitely a lot of that. Um, it's it put on the graffiti slide on okay. the bathroom. There's I one will. point where she's sort of documenting uh, that this community is, is, is sweets to the sweet, was what Candyman would say. Um, I think that's actually written in feces on the wall. Ew. I, so, um... I, I can't smell it from here, but I think it is. <laughs> and um, so she's documenting this sort of uh, urban decay, which becomes interwoven with sort of the Candyman mythology. And there are local gangs that are killing people and blaming it on Candyman. That's Man. right. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. But as it turns out, 
just like the folklore says, if you look in a mirror and say his name five times, guess what happens? Candyman's going to whoop your butt is what's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, Candyman does appear. You're going to get the hookup. And Candyman <laughs> is evil. And, you know, one of my gripes is why'd you have to kill Cassie Lemon's character, you know, if, if you're mad at white folks, but... Well, I think that his madness is probably just more more generalized. Yes. Maybe he was only killing the white part of Kevin. <laughs> but well, in any case. Uh, so, so, yeah, he turns out to be re- not only real, but completely deadly. And um, bees come pouring out of his mouth in, as, in one of the most memorable scenes right here. So, so yeah, I wanted to create my own uh, version of a story confronting uh, white supremacy and fear of violence. So I create, you know, the between. We can go back to our faces. The between okay. is a, the between is a, you know, a novel about a middle class black family. The father is a social worker. Uh, his wife is a judge, and she's getting threats from a white supremacist. Uh, and this is all set against sort of an alternate timeline. Like every time right. I, my character wakes up, he's in a different version of reality. So he might have a mustache this time, or, you know, his clothes are different this How time. How old were you when you wrote that book? I was in my, a lady never, you know, but I was in my late 20s. <laughs> yeah, that's a very sophisticated concept. You know, I think that Thank that you. was the first thing of yours that I read because it was, a, it was a finished book that was at that book signing. Right. And I took a look at that book and, you know, your work was simply mature. Well, and it, it, you, it, you, you, are, you were already well on your way to being what you are now. Well, I appreciate that. I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. I, I gave myself an artificial deadline. Uh, there was a screenwriting contest. And I used that, they were accepting novels, so I used that screenwriting contest as just a deadline, which was extraordinarily helpful. Writers have a deadline. Uh, I always struggle when I don't have deadlines. And sure enough, The Between was published in 1995. And, and ripped uh, off by 1997. <laughs> well, Somebody literally tried to rip the book off, wrote a script called The, the In Between, and actually optioned <laughs> it to a film company. <laughs> I know, yeah. I mean, so we had to have our lawyers. So, <laughs> anyway, but, but then I really do feel privileged to have come along when I did. It was on the heels of Terry McMillan. Um, I was out there, um, you know, basically... Uh, Helping to create a subgenre. Yes. So that included the late L.A. Banks, of course, yes. and Brandon Massey was out there at the very beginning. Yes, he was. And now, of course, we have a, an entire literary tradition of. It is wonderful. Hopefully, writers. some of you guys Cheshire are on Burke, this call right now. Tony LeBird. Can't um, even keep up with you. There's so many people out Kai there doing Shanti good Wilson, work. Nala Hopkinson. Um, there are Terrence Taylor. Yes. Um, I could keep going on and on and on with the names. I always, I hate listing even a single name because I know I'm going to leave someone out. But you know. But we love that you. I know. Valjean Jeffers. Hello. Um, so <laughs> I understand there are a lot of you out there writing and publishing horror, and we have created an actual movement. This is real. That's why I was being interviewed. That's why Tony Todd was being interviewed. This is real. That moment we've been waiting for, where black horror would finally get some respect, That's right. <laughs> is happening. And right if you stay to the eyes. end of this, we have got an announcement oh, for yeah, you that will make you very, very happy. Yeah, stay to the end. We have stay the end. Stay the end. Okay, so. So what about you and your journey? With, okay, uh, so um, let's see. I want to go back to some some pictures from from sure. from, from movies again. Yeah, so like um, to I, show I, pictures. I I think that it's it's kind of important. Oh. Okay, so here we go, and so I will switch. Way back I will go way way back, and there we go. Nineteen fifteen. Uh, all right, nineteen fifteen. You're talking about D. W. Griffith and the birth, birth of a nation. Birth of a nation. What you have there is, if you look at it in the right way, from one position, it's black man as monster. Definitely. Even though, in this case, it's black face man and as monster. It's, a, it's white man. Where it's, <laughs> once again, it's white man as monster, only wants us to believe he's black. Right. No, I didn't. Did I say that out loud? What? No, no, no. I didn't mean that. Uh, let's, so, black face man as monster. Kumbaya. Um, so, th- this was, and then images of zombies and other, and other things like this were, were perfectly natural. Once those became anathema and you no longer started seeing that, you know, then black people were sort of integrated into films in general. But one of the things that was kind of odd was that uh, we seemed to die disproportionately to our numbers and our what? representation. Uh, I mean, it was at the point where I would go see a, a, a movie with a black star like, say, Jim Brown or something like right. this. And the other kids in the neighborhood would ask me, well, how'd they kill the brother this time? Right. So I noticed a couple of different things. One, that we died more often. And two, that when I tried to tell this to white friends, they did not believe me. And this came to a head when I saw a movie called uh, 
Damnation Alley. And uh, Damnation Alley was uh, came out, I forget what year it came out in. It's probably maybe 78, something like that. I'll have our production assistant look that yes, up. Yes, you have you're, you have our production <laughs> assistant uh, look that up. Um, and um, I, I, I went there with a friend of mine named Dan, a uh, white guy, but uh, white Hispanic. And we're sitting there watching this movie, and it's basically... 1977. 1977. I missed it by one year. Okay, so we're sitting there watching this movie, which is basically about... Um, post-apocalyptic, and George Pippard, Paul Winfield, and Jan Michael Vincent are traveling across a nuclear, an atomic wasteland in basically a, a, an atomic-powered Winnebago. And they get to, I believe it was Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And out of the ruins of Las Vegas emerges Dominique Sanda, the last woman in the world. Right. And she's white. Are they going to draw straws? And I leaned over to my friend Dan, and I said... They're going to kill Paul Winfield. No. And he said, what? why? And I said, well, she's the last woman in the world. They're not going to pretend he's not interested. And they're not going to let him compete for her. Their only option, the only option they got left is to kill him. And he looked at me and he said, Steve, you are so cynical. And then what happened? And then what happened? Anybody see that movie? <laughs> Within five minutes... Paul Winfield gets eaten by giant cockroaches. And, and, and Dan, he's just like, he just couldn't believe it. He Those just, are some big cockroaches. They're big cockroaches. I know when I said giant, you were imagining cockroaches yeah, yeah. No, the size of... VW Beetles. Yeah, but now I see that if those were real, those would be... Big, those would be some mighty, pretty... Mighty, mighty big cockroaches. Scary cockroaches. So, I realized that not only were we being killed off, but we were being killed off disproportionately. And the, if you were not directly affected by it, in other words, black people knew it, but white people were in denial about it. Now, I'm going to make a conceptual leap here. I think that, the, in other words, there is no such thing as an American film. And I've, I've bet people money on this for years. There is no American film that's been released to the theaters. I mean, there might be one sitting on somebody's shelf someplace that they made in their backyard where all the white characters die, but non-white characters survive. There's no American film like that. There are tons of American films where people of color, all the all the, the black, all the non white characters die. Yeah. Um, plenty of them. It just just you know, more than you count. I've got a list of almost a hundred that's sitting on Google, on Google Docs. Just just oh, I'm just, really? just compiling oh, them. Oh, yes. Oh, I thought oh, okay. I'm actually compiling he the is list. Doing scientific studies. Absolutely. And, but, and and the deaths, by the way, to refresh, for those of you who are not familiar, sometimes you have the uh, sacrificial negro yes, you who have actually the, will jump in the way of trouble to save That's right. Uh, to in, save the in, in uh in John Wayne's movie uh The Alamo. Mm. Literally Sam Houston's slave throws himself over his master's body to receive the bayonet. Heroically, you know, it, it, it's not a surprise that, that John Wayne later on came out as a white racist, you know, right. a white separate, not white, so white supremacist in a Playboy interview. Right. But but this, you know, Jim Brown dying to protect the dirty dozen or dying in Ice Station Zebra and dying here and dying there. You know, this was just normal. Now, I'm going to make a leap. I think it's because any group will try to collect all that is good to their group. Any group will try to say they're more valuable, more precious than other groups. This is just a thing that human beings do. But I think that when you have a fraction of a second to make a decision, like a cop dealing with a, a fleeing felon, right. whether or not you consider this the fleeing felon to be like you, fully human. fully human, like one of your children, or whether you believe that this person is not quite human, is going to, be, is going to determine whether or not you pull the trigger. And it has led to things along the lines of the Black Lives Matter. Yeah, this movement. is at the heart of um, a lot of the issues that we are facing with police violence now. I mean, uh, very famously, there was a, a recent case where a white man uh, was, was killed by a police officer that has caused quite the outcry. Uh, but it's the same thing that those of us who are black and people of color and from mentally ill communities, for that matter, have been saying for years is that I, All just, my life. I just saw a study today that a third of people who were killed by strangers are killed by police officers. A third. You know, every black man I know has had an incident where this kind of thing has happened. Every every one of them. So I, you know, I, I can't, it's very difficult for me to, to grasp the fact that this is, um, it is debatable. That there are still people that are arguing about whether or not it happens. Right. So um, 
I believe that there is a connection between art and consciousness. Absolutely. That our consciousness creates art, but art also affects our consciousness. So I believe that when you have an opportunity to explore these images, to, to, to play with them, to extrapolate from them, to put them out into the public conscious so that people can debate them, talk about them, what is true? You know, what is happening here? I think that it is valuable. I think that art makes a difference. I think that art, in essence, when you're talking about images that are this powerful, they can affect decisions that involve life and death. Right. They just, they just can't. You know, I think that Dennis Haysbert being the president on 24 is one of the things that made it possible for Barack Obama to be elected. It because certainly people helped g- me survive the Bush years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was like, please let me escape into this show. I mean, there were some problematic aspects. Of, of course. But, but, but the, the president was, yes, Dennis Haysbert, to, to have that role. And with as much power and gravitas as he brought to that role was very, and I think it's true. I think it did lay the groundwork for uh, uh, an actual black president. Well, I think that it helped. You yeah. know, I think that art matters. I think that, that I looked at those images, and every single time I saw one of them, it hurt. Yes. It actually hurt. It's that question, the same question I brought up before that, that uh, Lawrence Fishburne asks in, in uh, the, the Tuskegee Airmen, the, the HBO movie. You know, what do I think about my country? What does my country think about me? How many times can you see yourself exterminated on screen realizing that white people never allow themselves to be exterminated on the screen, that there is no example? Of it, so it implies to me that that has meaning. It, right. impl- it implies to me that it represents an emotional choice. It may be unconscious, but it is a preference. And, it and is. It, I wish you did not exist. It would be okay with me if all of you. Yeah, died. yeah, pretty much. I'd be cool if. And I think you know, back in the in the day, uh, birth of a nation, during an era when there was actually a lot more open hostility, when the actual lynchings were an issue uh, in a more widespread way or, you know, mob lynchings and those sorts of things were more common, then it was it was hostile, maybe, to kill off the black characters, to make the black characters um, coon for you, to, to, you know, to relegate them to comic relief, all those sorts of things. There's a hostility to it. And I think as you get towards sort of that age of liberalism, so-called, it becomes more, well, we want to be inclusive in our movie. It doesn't look good to have, like, an ensemble cast and no people of color in it. So let's have a black guy or a black or a sassy black girl or whatever. But they're going to die early. Yes. Because, like, because you watching... have to show that there's danger and you have to start somewhere. You know, and, and who's <laughs> going to survive your movie? Most of the time it's going to be a young female of childbearing. Years. It's usually not going to be the that, sassy that, black friend that, who that survives. Represent... Well, it's usually a woman or it's a man and a woman. Right. Of breeding age. It's never going to be old people. That's it's a going happy to be people. ending. It's That's a happy, happy ending because ending. it represents the continuation of life. Just yesterday, I'm watching a movie, uh, Harbinger Down, mm-hmm. and there are two black people in the cast. It's it's an alien ripoff, you know, and, you know, a group of people on a ship that recover a, a Russian satellite, and there's something alive in the satellite that starts killing people on the ship. And a couple of the, of the crew members are black. And the thought that runs to my mind instantly is, they are dead. Mm-hmm. They are dead. If you are white, you have never experienced, you've never had that thought about whiteness. You may have had the thought, you may have been obese, and you see a, a fat person in the movie, and, and, and you think, oh, they're going to they're gonna kill the heavy guy, you know, or, oh, sure, sure. or you may, there may be a butch, a butch, a, a, a butch lesbian thing. Oh, they're going to kill, they're going to kill her. Often difference will manifest as someone who's going to be a victim. Yes. Or someone who's going to turn out to be the monster. That's right. That's how difference, and, and, and that's almost the only reason sometimes that there are characters that were there. Are different. You know, and <laughs> I, I can't help but have the sense that they're saying this is what we think about you. Right. You know, I can't, I can't get away from that completely. Not when I also hear people denying the concerns of Black Lives Matter. Right. You know, that, that no, this isn't happening, and if it does happen, they're thugs. You know, I, I they, they deserve it. They you know, have it coming. So, yeah, if, all these... if any of you have seen these images in movies of of us being of us being killed, um, and then looked at the real headlines and asked yourself, why? Are we on? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was the, the slide. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
then go ahead and like. Is that what you're going to say? Yes, yeah, so and go ahead, go yeah, ahead, give and, us and, some and, and give, give us some likes and some hearts. I wasn't clear on whether you all were seeing the slide or seeing our faces, so that was why. Yes, I you know we're not we're not sure. You know, sometimes the technology is not everything we would like it to be. <laughs> so, but uh, see, so, so there is a slide. Yeah. Okay. But there is our faces. There is our faces. Yes. So yeah, please. Sorry about that interruption. But yeah, if you if you know that that feeling, then absolutely. Yes. And that's what. Thank you. And that's what drives a lot of artists. I know that drives me. I was, uh, frankly. Uh, too much of a coward to do the things that my mother did to expose myself to tear gas attacks that I knew had damaged her eyes for the rest of her life or subject myself to, to jail uh, and abuse uh, or manhandling uh, by police when I knew how much anger and trauma that she carried in her body uh, right. and in her mind after that. It's, it's so, and I have so much admiration for people who are out there and ultimately, maybe before this is all over, we will all need to be in the streets. You know, who knows? But well, I mean, the thing is said about that, that history has shown us that things will get bad, that people will stay complacent until the heat gets bad to a particular level, at which point they will rebel. So, and then over and over again, there have been tyrants, there have been bad times, but basically human beings continue to organize for greater levels of connectivity and freedom. Right. This has been the, this has been the process of, of of humanity, and I have every faith that it's going to be our process too. Yeah. Good. So you know, I, I have no doubts about that. But I think that it is going to be necessary for us to be willing to stand up, and for those of us who are artists, artists can make their make themselves known simply by expressing their feelings, expressing their hearts. Absolutely, and that's where you know my whole uh, idea for my the UCLA course, the Get Out, right, came from, based on the sunken place. In fact, I just saw a tweet earlier today where someone said, "Well, people who were doing this, I don't remember what it was. People who were doing that are in the sunken place." You know, so it's become part of our language, and uh, that movie is is so brilliant because it does help us define us rather than being defined. By others. So this is a great um, Zora Neale Hurston quote that we're about to put up. If you're silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. So what we're suggesting that you do is to believe that your voice has meaning. Right. And, you know, so these these broadcasts are for fans, creators and teachers of creators. Right. That basically, if you want to spread these ideas, if you want to contact, you want to talk about these and why these things are important, I believe that genre is tremendously important because genre speak often speaks directly from emotion. Oh, yeah. It is, you know, and it often deals with very strong emotions like fear and pain. And there's a lot more study now on that relationship between trauma and horror. And the horror, one of my coworkers recently lost her mom, and she's a horror writer, and she was talking about how she finds comfort in those stories. You know, when you stared down the the actual beast, the absolutely worst scenario in actual life uh somehow we are wired sometimes to take comfort in the imaginary beasts uh to to give us some sort of a lesson or or to to help us extract some of that pain there's also something that i think i call it collapsing a waveform in other words that, that if you if, once again if you're if you're a woman if you're gay if you are disabled if you have an issue then this will apply to you in a slightly different way that the lie about who you are is the ex is an external issue. It's 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 the story that is being told. If there is a contrast between the lie that is being told and who and what it is you really are as a human being, that then there is energy that you release simply by telling the truth. As soon as you tell the truth, the first person in any dysfunctional relationship. The first person who tells the truth ends the relationship. The, a new relationship must begin. You get a boom. You get a, a boom from the energy that is released. So there have been countless works of art, books and movies and so forth, that spoke the truth about something that had been a lie and released the energy from it. And what I'm thinking is that the reason why we responded so, so strongly to get out is it spoke a truth, not that... A truth in, in, in terms of uh, reportage historically, that, that, or, or you know, contemporary, that, that this is the way the world is. Right. It is a truth about how people feel about the right. world. Right. Right. And right. I, I, I feel that if you take a look at what we can piece together in the history of how Jordan created this movie, 
um, we what we can look at Mr. Him. Peel to you, sir. Mr. <laughs> Peel, I'm sorry. I'm no, no, my, my boy, Jordan, <laughs> my ace Boone Coon. Um, that we're talking about a young man of tremendous intelligence, right? Who you know in college looked out at the world and wondered, what is my place in the world? And he studies he studies music mm -hmm. and he studies drama mm -hmm. and he he goes into doing improv comedy. Yeah, and he and it's like my mother when I'm ten years old tells me, you know, don't let white people know how smart you are; they will kill you. Mm -hmm. Now he's not going to run into that, but he is going to have the issue of you know what is he in the world? Oh, he, and he's facing all kinds of uh, microaggression. That's and, right. Uh, so what yeah. is he? What has he found? He found that he could make people laugh. Right. And so he goes into comedy, Mad TV, and later on Key and Peel. How many remember back in the day, Mad TV, even before Key and Peel? I was a fan from way back. And yeah, I, know I, I love too. this guy, and I right. love Keegan Michael Keys. I mean, I was I, always like, why if, doesn't SNL get them? But Bobby Lee. They were yeah, too big for SNL. That's, that's what, like. what we were wondering. Yeah. Why doesn't SNL pick these well, guys right. up? What is wrong with them? When they when they needed an Obama, they, <laughs> they let the white guy on SNL do Obama rather than bringing in Keegan Michael Keys right. or Jordan Peele. Yeah, that I, made no sense I think to they me. Just since they were too big a force to to fall into line or something. Well, I something. Know. But I what I'm saying what I'm saying is that he. I believe that he used his comedy to survive in the business long enough to figure out where the power was. And where the power is, is in creating your own material, right? controlling it. So back during the Obama administration, 10 years ago, this, you know, not 10 years ago, but, but he oh started writing it during the Obama administration. Right. So maybe like eight years ago, not right. eight, seven years ago. He starts writing this script that eventually became Get Out. Right. And he developed it. He said that he... Started, he was developing the script bef long before he ever wrote. By the time he wrote the script, he knew every line, every scene, everything. So that's a very it, simple premise uh, for the one or two of you who might not have seen Get Out. Um, a black man played by Daniel Kaluuya, Chris, is going to spend the weekend at the home of his white girlfriend and her parents. This is Rose Armitage, played by Allison Williams. And let's just say that things go badly wrong when they're there. This is the uh, mother, played by Catherine Keener, who happens to be a hypnotist. And she's very keen on having him stop smoking for some reason. Helping him stop smoking. <laughs> we find out why. We find out finally. And, and, yeah. it's, and this is where he, uh, Peel introduces this fantastic concept of the sunken place. In fact, I have another gift that's even better that shows him falling through the floor, falling back literally falling back into his childhood. So so this and is to to help prime him for their nefarious plan, which is basically to auction his... Well don't don't you don't have to say what the what the plan is. Why? Well, because some of the people might not have seen Oh, it. I'm sorry. Th that's okay. Never mind. This is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. This is nothing. I'm going to go back to our faces for this a minute. This is uh, just, you know. No, it's just, it's getting just Getting to stuff. know you. Getting to know all about, about you. Getting so, to like you. <laughs> so anyway. Oh, excuse So me. that's Get Out. So he does this. He creates Sound of music flashback. Explosive. And I've seen, you know, whether you're a white viewer or a black viewer, um, white viewers are saying, oh, I, I have a better understanding now of race relations and what it must feel like to be that only one receiving all these microaggressions for black viewers. It's like, finally... Like from the opening scene when the character named Andre is in the suburban neighborhood, finally a movie that conveys that I'm scared in your neighborhood. <laughs> you don't even yes. be scared of me. I'm scared of you. Look, so so there are several different things from the. I think that Jordan, what he did was he took his sense of of having to balance in terms of his identity, right. you know, racially, culturally, in terms of his ambitions, in terms of wondering about his identity as a human being, as a man. And he took those insecurities and he put it into his work. So he was able to express something where from a black point of view, he's able to express black fear that even our allies are not our friends. Even right. our allies objectify us. Even these white, the white liberals who say that they love us see us as objects. And I don't okay. think you have to be um, even a person of color or black to walk around wondering you know, how many people secretly hate me. Now. Right. You know, in the wake of the election, right? Sure. Like, you're like, but, but, but that's the how that's, many people in this supermarket line are smiling at me right now. But that's the other but side. But they would like the push other, a button to make me disappear if they could. The other side is white people who wonder, is there too much damage for us to ever be trusted, for us to ever have trust mm. again? That that the black part of it is, 
Is there anyone I can trust? The white part of it is what do I need to do to gain trust? Look at this. Look at all the damage that exists. And both sides are afraid. Both sides are afraid that we cannot come together because that's what we have to do to heal our country. Mm -hmm. Just like the different aspects of, of a marriage have to come together to heal a relationship or, or your psyche have to come together to heal yourself as an individual human being. Right. What Jordan Peele did is because he had both the honesty to go into... You know, I love digging into this movie. I really do. Because a good movie, a movie that is well done, will tolerate that kind of, of analysis. By being honest about his fears, his fears in relationships, you know, the who loves me, the what, his fears about the world, the questions about his identity, that is what creates the horror. But if he had not been a world-class comedian, if he did not know exactly the moments in which to release the tension through laughter, he would not have. He would have created an experience that was unendurably intense. Mm -hmm. And in creating an experience that is unendurably intense, it would have been about ten percent as successful as it was. It would have made about twenty-five million dollars instead of making two hundred and fifty million dollars. What he did then was see that's art. You take your, you take your personal feelings, and you combine it with your craft. In this case, it was not just his mastery of of cinema. I'm mm -hmm. sure that he I'm sure he is is an absolutely has an encyclopedic understanding of cinema. He just loves movies and watching movies and was able to pull pieces from a dozen different films that allowed him to have you know the image systems and the thematics and and the kinds of dialogue that would pull all these things together. Right. But also his craft of humor, knowing the timing he. he yeah, because he was worried. He told yes. my class, well, some of you may have heard, that he made a surprise visit to my Yeah, I heard a rumor class. about that. That was so exciting. And one of the things he talked about was that since he was working on Get Out during the Obama administration, during what he called the post-racial lie, uh, he worried and maybe heard from people, that, but specifically he talked about being worried that the movie would come off as too confrontational. Because notice even now, when when we make very valid points about race, we're accused of being the problem. To yes, talk right. about race is racism. Right. Hello? It's like to talk about <laughs> cancer is cancer. Right. So, to talk about terrorism makes you a terrorist. So it was only by, uh, I hate to use the word luck, but a, a shift in administration that Get Out appears not during the Obama, sort of the apparent placid nature of a racial conversation in the Obama era, but in this explosive and in-your-face and marching down the street with Tiki Torses era of the Trump years, uh, that Get Out fits in perfectly in that conversation. Get Out is, is, is the movie that's right on time. The timing is excellent, but here's, I guess, what I'm saying, that, that art is self-expression, that what we know is that there are people out there who are listening to this who have the heart and the mind to create or to nurture that creation in others. And I think that this is a time when people are open to the conversation in ways they never have been. In other words, if I talk about white people, black people, you know, men and women, because we kind of go from black man as monster to white woman as monster. Get out, or, or, yeah. Yeah, or blackness as monster, as monstrosity to whiteness as monstrosity. And the real question is human beings, humanity as monster. That if you understand, if you're coming from a position of believing in equality, then all you're really looking at is this is how this looks from this position. This is what happens when this group gets power. This is what happens if this group can control the, the lines of communication. Well, it, it certainly resonated with a white exactly. audience. Because it made $250 million, a quarter of a billion dollars. You think about... And it's not even a Marvel movie, people. <laughs> I mean, there was no special effects. In no. fact, Jordan Peele doesn't even like comic book movies. Yeah, he so. wants to move beyond that. He believes that there is something beyond that. That, yes. that we can change the world together. That art can do that. And that there is a new wave that is coming. And, and I, it can be huge. And I see so much pride, not just in the black horror community, which is a smaller subset of the larger horror community, there's a sense of pride that Get Out is as quality a film as it is. Finally, oh my it God! Yes. Out, like it's like when the best horror films are here. It's all anybody can talk about, you know. So and, and he wants to promote 
new voices. Right. I mean, and, and voices. everybody who's listening to this and all the people not listening to this have been marginalized in some way in your lives. Well, sure. If you pretend to be part of a pack, that's just fine. But there is some part of you, the life is a Procrustean bed. It, it cuts off pieces of you, of you to make you fit. And all you have to do is reclaim those pieces that are cut off and find ways to express it in, in, in fiction. Now, if you're writing horror fiction, then you take a fear and you exaggerate it in the same way that you do if you're writing comedy. Comedy yeah. and, and horror are much alike in the sense that it takes something absurd or painful about life, exaggerates it, and then you either release that tension through a scream or a laugh. Right. You know, and so, you know, if, 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 there is, if there are people out there who have the sense that you want to be a part of this, that you have something to contribute it's to this. Give us, give, give us some likes. Let us, let us know that you're there. It, understanding it better, uh, creating it yourself, being a, a better informed fan of the work, to understand more of the history of the work. Let's just see some of those likes, because I know a lot of you are horror heads, especially if you're uh, on my Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. We want to uh, contribute to this conversation so that we have stories that are both uh, Candyman, where we, we can have a black monster, but at the same time we have Get Out, which is also counter imagery, um, and, and tells a fuller story. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing the hearts, and we're seeing that you guys love this as much as we do. And so we're really glad that, that you're here every week, and you, and, you, and you let us into your homes. Let us talk to you about this. Because I know that... You know, there are three things that you need. You need to have a clear idea of what it is you're trying to accomplish. You need to have the emotions. You need to have the why. Why do you want to do this? And only then do you figure out the, the, the to-do the to list, you know, the how do you do it. Right. So if, if my goal is to change the world, and the reason I want to do it is to create a better world for my children, my, my friends, my neighbors, my tribe, my, my, my wifey, to, 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 to be able to create something that, well, that outlives me. Um, then the question is, how do I do this? I do this through my own work, even though I knew that it was going to cause me pain, that it, I was going to run into, into problems. And I wanted to, to create, and I saw these images of people like me being killed in this movie. So I started writing, and I thought that the science fiction field would welcome me with open arms. And I found out later on, I've, I've told this story before, that I would, start, I would notice that my stuff wasn't getting reviewed. And I found out that there were actually racist forces against me. That after he died, um, one, of, one of the greatest, one of the biggest uh, editors. Edi editors in the science in fiction the field. field died. Two of his editors came forward to me and said, Steve, you need to know that you have been blackballed from the magazine on racial grounds. Wow. And you know, I, so I knew that there was, a, there was a limit to how far I was going to be able to go. I didn't have infinite energy to try to drag that lock up the hill. But I knew that if I could stay in the game long enough, that there would be young, younger, tougher people who did not have as much scar tissue as I had. Jordan Peele was is just about the first one to get it across the line. Not, not I look at Ryan Coogler and I say, "Wow!" I look at Ava DuVernay, yeah, and I say, "Wow!" And they're not even doing horror, but that's right. In the scholarship, you know, Dr. Kenitra Brooks, Kenitra Brooks, sorry. Uh, Sycorax's Daughters uh, was an editor for that with Linda Addison, who's also a horror writer. Um, and there's a third co-editor. Uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm slipping up on the name. But uh, just uh, Dr. Brooks also just has a, a, a book of horror crit uh, criticism out, um, new and contemporary black See, horror writers. This is what we need. I, I, I believe in this. Yes. You know, and, and you guys give me hope. And, and, and people like Ryan Coogler and Ava DuVernay and, and, and Jordan Peele, Give me hope. I know, and some of you are going to are going to come after that. Yes. So I was sad that uh, my my UCLA class uh, wrapped up. Although I'm teaching it again winter quarter, so I'm very excited about that, and I'll be glad to get past the grades. But there was so much interest in the UCLA class because you know after the Jordan Peele visit, it got a lot of uh, got a lot of publicity. Um, I even had a call from TMZ. All kinds of weird things happening. Uh, people say, "Oh, I wish I were there." Now, if you are there, uh, that class is even booked for winter quarter. It's, it, is that one that's standing yeah. room only? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're already booked. It's um, already booked. So, so what I decided just very recently was yeah, it wasn't heck, wasn't we, more we, than a month ago. We we we, we, we were getting ago. inquiries from from other countries, from South Africa and from Europe, and you know people saying, "I wish we could take the class." And I'm like, "Well, why can't you take the class?" So we have decided to 
to launch a public webinar version of The Sunken Place, now, Black he, Horror, uh, Racism, Survival, and Black Horror. Now, what you need to be, be aware of is that it's not your imagination if you think that there are barriers between you and getting your ideas out there. That there really are people. In other words, if I, sta if I stand up and I say, I believe in human equality, there are people who will attack me for believing that people are equal. They're, they're, they literally will attack me for that. And if you stand up and you say you have pride in yourself, you know that, that, that women have control over their bodies, that black people are just as good as white people, that gay people have the right to love who, who they will, that disabled people have the right to be seen as full human beings and not just and a treated, collection of, of, of organs or, or, or limbs, you will be attacked for this. That, that if, and if, you, if your work has been artistic work and has come from a place of truth within you, there are people who did not want you to get that truth out. This is not a hallucination. It is not your imagination. If, if you wonder why these movies have failed, why these people have failed, or why you have failed, there really are people who have tried to stop you. And what we're doing now is we're seeing that with new media, yeah. you can go completely around the obstructions. And by following the example of people who have successfully navigated the minefield, you know where the safe spaces are. There are other people, you know, we've got, I got arrows in my back. Okay, I was a pioneer. Tanana Reed was a pioneer. Octavia was a pioneer. Chip Delaney, pioneer. All these pioneers, for God's sake, listen to what they're saying. Walk Where they are walking across the river, you know that there are rocks underneath their feet. All you have to do is follow the examples and understand the history of the field that you're trying to go into, and you can succeed at, 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 a, at an accelerated pace. So our Black Horror course is a six-week overview course. It's both films and literature. So absolutely, we will be talking about Candyman. We will be talking about Get Out. Blackula, William Marshall starred in that. He brought a similar dignity to that role <laughs> that, uh, that uh, Tony Todd brings to Candyman. Dwayne Jones in the top right hand. Maybe you've never seen Ganja and Hess. That that was one of the lost black horror classics. And, and of course, the, the Skeletal Bride is from Wes Craven's Serpent and the Rainbow. His treatment of voodoo, what do we think about it? But it's not just the movies. We also discuss an array of authors in the class. Uh, primarily short stories because they're easy to access and, and you can read them relatively easily. So Nalo Hopkinson, Victor Laval, who has his... Uh, novel, The Ballad of the Black Tom in Development, I believe it's at AMC, uh, Cheshire Burke there on the left, uh, up, and com up and coming, well, really established horror writer at this point, new writer Kai Ashanti Wilson wrote a fantastic story, um, A Force to be Reckoned With, so it's the film, the literature of black horror, what it is, what it means, uh, where it's going, and we have a special guest lined up because the Jordan Peele has agreed to also address our uh, webinar with an uh, do an interview with us just like he came in the in he came class. to my UCLA class and then when you asked when we asked him about that well you asked him about that he, he was like hey right yeah. of course of course, of course. so and he's just let me tell you that was so fantastic for him to uh, to speak to the class the points he made about the film the nuances he's just so um, bright and gifted and this is the kind of course, you know, that works for you, whether you are uh, a writer yourself or you're just a horror fan. You know, you like watching the movies, you're a filmmaker, um, you're a teacher, you know, maybe you're a horror filmmaker and you want to have, you know, inclusivity and you don't want to make the same mistakes that some of your predecessors have made in terms of you your treatment. Study of the people who came before. Everything right. in my life from having relationships to earning my black belts in the martial arts, to studying, to, to being a successful writer, has come from studying the people who succeeded before me and then finding out how they felt about it, how they thought about it, and what they did, and then doing that. And so by going into, whether you're interested in this as a, as a fan or as a potential filmmaker or as a writer or teacher, we're going to give you those things. Yeah, and people who have taken the course have said, um, you know, my students had a great time. Of course, they haven't gotten their grades yet, but <laughs> <laughs> the best class we've ever taken, Professor did too, is the best teacher we've ever had. Well, I shouldn't even be reading that. but anyway, Yes, I'll read that for you. The <laughs> best class we've ever taken, <laughs> Professor Dewis. The best teacher we've ever had, and they said, meant it. They had tears in their eyes. Oh, well, they listen, they we loved all, you. We all had tears in our eyes. It was a really emotional experience, this class. And... Um, 
we have all of this, you know, bundled, well, this class by itself, if you were enrolling and getting it for credit, which we're not offering, we're not offering credit, we're, no. we're offering education. So it's six weeks of classes where we send you, um, they're not all entirely consecutive because of schedules, but you'll get six different links, interviews with uh, artists and creators that the, the, will recommend or study movies, books, short stories, and art. All digital download and live stream at your convenience. So now, one of the things that is true is that we're shifting to a new platform because there was so much interest. And we can, there's a limit to how many people that we can get into class. And we're already about, you know, we're, we're close to 50% filled up at this point. So, you know, just you know, don't let that happen to you. The total value of this, if you were taking this through a university, would be at least $1,280. That's about the cost of a UCLA class. Right. And um, so, you and know, we're these, offering more, actually. Than yes, we are. That. We because have, that's the thing. We want to make sure that you've got everything you need to either understand, create, or teach black horror. So one of the first one of the first extras we did is the lecture that you gave, Tanana Reeve Secrets of a Writer's Life. It's a separate lecture. And it's it's wonderful because she's really being honest about her feelings and how she turns her feelings into art. In a very specific and, and explicit way, she's not holding anything back. Yeah, I think that you can kind of tell from from the way we talk and the way we teach. We're not holding anything back. We're giving everything that we possibly can. We have a second bonus, which is uh, also a talk I gave on writing the thriller. I teach in an MFA program, and I work with a lot of students who've been through MFA programs who never taught, who never learned um, structure and plotting. Uh, so if you like page turners, but your teachers didn't, <laughs> this is a good opportunity for you to learn how to write. Yeah, story. you know, I've often said about about uh, literary literary fiction. If there was an earthquake yesterday, if there was an earthquake on Monday and a tornado on Wednesday, the literary novel takes place on Tuesday. Uh, they will literally avoid the action so in order to talk about feelings. How do you write action and feelings? Which is what I try to do. That's that lecture on writing the thriller. And Steve also has a very good lecture on writing horror screenplays that he uh, did it. Yes, I did that Expo. at the Screenwriting Expo. It's wonderful. It's professionally produced, and you're going to get you're going to get a copy of that. It's a it's a ninety nine dollar value, and you know these bonuses are to make sure you have everything everything you need in order to get everything that you want in this particular arena. So the, and then my other, my favorite bonus is um, this next one, number four. Um, some of you on here might have taken it or heard about it before. We did a four-week virtual screenwriting workshop, which you will begin to receive immediately after signing up. That's the, right. the, the Black Horror course doesn't sound, start until mid-January, but you can start your screenwriting bonus, you know, almost immediately. And that is for lectures. It's a very similar format to what we've done here, and we have a special guest. At the end, who uh, Cheo Hodari Coker, the showrunner for Luke Cage, talked about That's screenwriting. Right. So that was a, a, a nice, uh, we, we forgot to put his picture, but he was there and, and he was a fantastic guest. So if you put all those things together, one, two, three, four, uh, you get the Sunken Place Black Horror Class, my lecture on Secrets of a Writer's Life, my lecture on Writing the Thriller, Steve's wonderful lecture on Writing Horror Screenplays, and the virtual screenwriting workshop, if you put all of that together, it would be worth almost $3,000, $2,797. Now, listen, we're not going to charge you $2,797 for this. You know that. We know that. But I would like to ask you a very simple question. If you're a teacher, if you are a writer, if you know a writer, love a teacher, because Christmas is coming up. Right. And, and if you think that, oh, my God, this would be a perfect gift for somebody that I love or a perfect way to kick off the new year, and we could help you sell just one book, one story, make one film, wouldn't it be worth it? Wouldn't it be worth it to you if this work, if, if expressing yourself honestly, if expressing your emotions, if doing these things can help change the world, if you know you were hurt by bad images on film, then think about all the healing you can create with positive images, images of, of victory, images of love, images of triumph. And some little gems you've missed, you might love horror and think you've seen it all, but there's there's some stuff out there you haven't seen yet and haven't had a chance to talk about. So wouldn't it be worth it if, if you could just learn more about the, the genre that you love? Yeah, we're doing another thing. There's actually another extra that oh, we're adding. I forgot about this one. You know, and it's, just, it's going to take place after we do the six-parter, but we're actually going to do a complete mini-webinar. Probably, I would be surprised if it wasn't three parts, about basically making your own movie. It's everything that we know about making a movie 
from literally zero dollars. I actually, you know, speaking of zero dollars, yes. my students at UCLA have the opportunity to make a short film rather than writing an essay, which a couple of them uh, took that option. They did amazing films on virtually no budget. Well, and what we need to do is you need to get permission from them to post those on YouTube and actually we can actually use those as examples. Yeah, to I actually mean, really, show how these things are done. So how they were basically done? using the lessons that they learned from the course and then making their own version of a short horror. They did great, a great job. But maybe you have an idea or a short story. A lot of you are prose writers. Uh, you're going to take that screenwriting course to learn how to write your screenplay, but now you want to make your movie. Well, we're going to show you how to do it starting with zero resources because the truth is you can move to zero and because of modern technology and communications, and because the, of the power of a camera in an iPhone, for instance, you can literally make a movie for nothing that competes with what Hollywood used to do for many thousands of dollars. Right. And if you've got a story sense, if you've got a visual sense, then your ability to actually stair-step to use your, your zero-budget uh, movie to raise $500, your $500 budget movie to raise $5,000 to stair-step your way up. It, it, we, has, we it has never been. We crowdfunded uh, Danger Ward, our short zombie film, and so we're going to have tens of thousands. Of we we will have an expert talking about crowdfunding. Yeah. We'll have experts talking about production and direction. So just take a look at everything that we're going to be offering here. And just it, run it down. It's, yes, it's, it's run the it sunken place course uh, based on the black horror course I've been teaching at UCLA that Jordan Peele visited and will give us an interview for. Uh, my secrets of a writer's life, those things I wish I had been told when I just started out, my lecture on writing the thriller, those of you who have been structure and thrill uh, deprived in your writing program, <laughs> this is for you. Steve's lecture, I love his lectures on writing horror screenplays, the virtual screenwriting workshop where you can put all that to use or gift it to someone uh, who, who wants to write screenplays more than you do, and then the making of Danger Word, our short film, how you can start with nothing like my students, and make a, a, a short film that you will have and you can actually put up on YouTube so and share and maybe what, option for a larger piece. What we're calling it is from zero to 60 million. Basically, how to get there starting with nothing. So now, all of those things, all of those extras, but the main thing, that Black Horror Course, The Sunken Place, all available um, for a special price until uh, January 1st. Well, look, in, in 2018... We're going to slash, we're, the price is going to be slashed to three ninety eight. But until January Raised. 1st, Raised it's, well, it's going to be slashed from that $4,000 oh, that we oh, could oh, do, oh, right. you know, and, yes, and the sorry. individual pieces of it right. would, would total up to. But until January 1st, it's only $348. So, you know, we are, we're trying to do everything we can to get the information in your hands as, you know, as expeditiously as possible. We have a social media group. We, you know, we interact with you guys as much as much as we can. We you know that there are there are so many things. There's so many levels to what it is that we're doing. What we're trying to do is to create a movement of people who are similarly committed to changing the world with art. And we believe that some of you are part of this. Check out the website at www.realblackhorror.com. There's more information about the course. We have photos. We have more information about what we'll be talking about. But www.realblackhorror.com, www.realblackhorror.com. Now, there is a 30-day guarantee on it. I mean, if you don't like, if you don't like the course, um, we're happy to give you your money back because we believe in satisfied customers. The only way this spreads is by word of mouth. And you know, the people who have experienced us, experienced our teaching, know that we're the real thing. And they're, they're our friends, the people who are contributing, to helping us move this forward, are also the real thing. And we're not holding anything back because I believe, deep in my heart, that some of you people are smarter and tougher and better than I ever could have been. And if I can help you stand on my shoulders and see further, I am happy happy to i want to see your work i want to see it so much and so we have a surprise we didn't even mention we said if you stay until the end yes we would have a surprise and what is that surprise well, the, the surprise artwork. announcement is Our, not just jordan peele but antony todd has agreed to do an interview we will talk to him to share with you yes as a part of the black horror course we're going to be sharing with candy man himself is coming to our class isn't that great? It's going to be absolutely fantastic, and we just want you to be a part of this. this My is UCLA great. students are going to be jealous. <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> but anyway, they, we, they got Jordan, so. We, we want you to be a part of a historic movement. If you have the heart and the desire to be a part of this, 
Um, you know, we love you. We, we always thank you for being, for letting us come into, uh, your living rooms, you know, on, on Saturday, you know, I, I can't tell you enough. We're doing everything we can to make this, you know, to make this work for you. So, you know, we have questions now about anything that we've said. This is the time to ask, and we are happy to, you know, we're, we're, we're here. I saw a question I'm looking for. How was it? What, looking for the, uh, I thought it was April. Anyway, there's a whole big discussion going on in the comments. That's why it's taking me a long time to find the question I was looking for. But, uh, oh, Steve, uh, April Driver is asking, can you recall a film where both, survivors were black or or, or even yes the other yes there is a movie in which there are two survivors that are black however there were also white people who survived it was uh, i think it was called uh uh devil fish or something like that it took place in the like the louisiana swamps and there were two survivors at the end who were who were black but there have been there have been white characters earlier in the movie who did not get get munched on by the fish got it got it got it any other questions so any other questions um i see a lot of people were talking about some of their uh favorite movies uh z for zachariah um now i had a problem with z for zachariah because it was another movie oh wait this isn't a favorite this is a problematic yeah go yeah on. z for zachariah <laughs> was 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 definitely problematic because it was a uh, white author convenience they emasculated the black character in order to let the white, and then the white male character, you know, is the one who, who gets laid, who get who gets the girl. You know, so the black character is dithering, and oh, I don't know if I should do this, I don't know if I should do that, and the white woman is saying, come and get it. You know, and, and he and he can't he can't move, he's frozen. So, no, I, I have a problem with Z for Zachariah. It is not, you know, it is not on my, my faves list. Um, let's see, what else, what, who I else? I don't see anything the comments there was a lot of conversation about movies on the thread a lot of encouragement let's, let's go back to our pictures i'm really glad that you all uh, have enjoyed the information we've shared with you today you know what's really funny is i had just reached out to tony todd again twitter and um got an email from him the uh, night before i did the interview and the way i heard he was actually in the studio was he told me <laughs> he had just been there and i was like oh my gosh so i uh, it was just weird it's like i i had literally had my first communication with the man via email the night before and then the next day we're, we're all of a sudden like in the same uh, circles <laughs> like he's showing up at the same place um so yeah it is, uh, it's an exciting time for me. It was actually very emotional for me to do that interview. And at, at the time, I thought it might have been the wildfires making my eyes tear up. Well, why do you think you were so emotional, honey? I don't know. Maybe because you were my, gonna wreck me because my night. mother's birthday is today. Okay. And maybe it was because she was the one who was the first horror fan of my life. Or it could be, honestly, on some level, I've waited so long. And it's so gratis, gratifying to reach this point where we're even having a conversation about black horror in such a significant way. You know, I look at things along the lines of the, uh, the sexual harassment, you know, uh, rules, the you know, gay people talking about their right to have, you know, not just be married, but have that celebrated by, you know, something as simple as a, as, as a wedding cake. Right. You know, um, freedom of speech at the same time that there's all this backlash in Washington, all this push to try to turn the clock back. People literally saying, "Oh, America was better during slavery." You know, it's like that. That I can't. That tells you what they're saying. They're speaking in code words, but they're you know they're 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 saying you know put women back in the kitchen, yeah, put gays back in the closet, and put black people back in shackles. But you know what helps us fight back? What's that? Art helps us fight back. It helps us survive. And you know what my favorite art is? What's your favorite art? Black horror. www.realblackhorror.com Type it into the type of the field. www.realblackhorror.com Thank you all so much. We know you have a lot of places you could be on a Saturday evening. Thank you for spending it with us. Check out the course. Check out the page. And have a great weekend, everyone. You take care. We love you all. Be gentle with each other. Um, and I'll see you next week. www.realblackhorror.com Candyman Candy Man. Candy man, candy man, candy man, candy man.